Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our um, CT Forum, uh, Tuesday, 11th of May session for Marian Ian's Co Fellowship. We have various uh, fellowship uh, winners, starting from Trudy um, to Sally Singh. We have three uh, chairs today, Abu, uh, Zoe, and myself going to alternately presenting the presenters. Our first presenter is Trudy Elliott, going to speak about the SCTS Fellowship Travel Award from Manchester Lung Health Check Visit, October 2019. Trudy, thank you so much for speaking. Hello, my name is Trudy Elliott and I'm a thoracic nurse case manager at UHS. My presentation is to tell you how I used my SCTS Fellowship Nursing Travel Award that I gained in 2019. Due to COVID, I was unable to present last year and you may notice that I look somewhat different now. In 2016-17, a pilot service to detect early lung cancer in deprived areas of South Manchester was instigated by a collaboration of Macmillan Cancer Improvement Partnership and the University Hospital of South Manchester. The conclusions from these programmes were that a targeted community-based lung cancer screening programme delivered within the NHS can engage those most at risk and detect a high proportion of curable early lung cancers. Much of this success was due to the patients having access to a community-based one-stop service with instant access to a low-dose CT scanner. In 2019, Southampton was confirmed as one of the 10 new sites to be given investment and begin this programme. It would be offered to adults to age between 50 and 80 with a smoking history. Invitation was to be via GP and the mobile units will be placed in community settings in supermarket car parks, for example, or equivalent. So my plan was to visit Manchester and see how this was working there and how it may affect Southampton services. I wanted this experience to be made available to a group of nurses from Southampton. So I invited three other senior nurses from within the UHS thoracic nursing team. The aims of our visit were to understand how referral to the unit is made, see firsthand the health screening units in action, speak to staff working within the units, including nurses, research staff and support staff, understand the processes and management of patients through the unit, observe patients in the unit if appropriate, and have awareness of difficulties and challenges, and ultimately to understand the possible implications for Southampton when scanning began there. We visited the unit, which was placed in a Tesco's car park, Cheatham Hill, and were welcomed by various members of the staff there. We were shown around the units, the processes and challenges were explained to us in detail, and we had a very informative and positive experience there. We also wanted to take the opportunity to vi visit Withenshaw Hospital, where the mobile unit space office was. Kath Hewitt, the lead nurse in the Rapid Hub um, office, kindly facilitated our visit to Manchester, which included the mobile units as well as services at Withenshaw Hospital and the areas that thoracic patients would see whilst there. This included outpatients, wards and intensive care. During our time at Withenshaw Hospital, we split into smaller groups and were able to experience patients' interactions in various areas of the hospital. We spoke to many different um, staff members and gained a very good understanding of the services available there. The visit was extremely interesting and very helpful in understanding the requirements that Southampton would need to provide when health checks started locally. We enjoyed our visit greatly and learnt a lot, as well as being able to compare our services at Southampton with those of Manchester. Some interesting ideas came back to UHS with us, 
but we also came back feeling very proud of how we deliver our care to Southampton and extended patients. We managed to find some time to do some team building of our own, as you can see from the photographs. But essentially, I would encourage anyone to apply for an SCTS Fellowship Travel Award. It gives the winner the scope to investigate, compare, learn and gain new experiences. I'd like to make a few thank yous, including all those at SCTS, Dr. Bhutan for his sponsorship on our visit and Kath Hewton for facilitating our visits. Um, I've also included a few references if you wish to investigate this further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trudy. It is a very nice presentation and I'm really proud that you have come from Southampton to Manchester because I work in Manchester. It's sad that I couldn't be able to see you, but it's Cathy Hubert has done a, a, a fantastic job in Vidinsha Hospital with, uh, you know, Miss Dr. Ali Marshall and their great team. So how you are doing in your place after what you have learned before we get any question and answer? So how is the program, what you have learned, to have you able to, you know, yeah, yeah. Into practice. as far as my, my role is concerned, uh, it um, just gave us an idea of how many referrals that we'd receive. Um, they are doing it at Southampton at the moment, but it's, it's still um, based at one of the hospitals, so it's not quite out in the community just yet. Are you planning to put any other form of guidelines or protocol to make that happen in future? Uh, yeah, I'm not part of the team that's actually doing it, but one of our consultants for, in thoracic surgery is, um, it sits on the, 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 the committee board and is very much involved in it. Um, we do, we are seeing patients coming through now and that did start before COVID um, and then it's obviously picking up again now. Um, I think the next stage is um, to take it out into the community more, but it is as we saw in Manchester, it's a big uh, security side of it is a big issue because obviously it's very expensive equipment and finding somewhere that's safe to place it is, is quite a challenge for them. As I, I'd spoken to um, one of the um, ACS staff recently, who's very much involved with it. Um, but at the moment in Southampton, it's back based down the Royal South Hans Hospital. Um, but they are looking and obviously because Southampton was one of 10 units, of course, everybody wants um, the units at the same time to spread it out through the rest of the, the British Isles. So everybody wants the same equipment at the same time. So that's obviously a challenge as well. Type your answer, question and answer in the section, please. So we will get it on the chat. and. Uh, the main thing I want to ask uh, Trudy is Trudy, because we ask, you know, as you being a successful, you know, have a fellowship uh, and applicant, we are really struggled to get this for everybody to apply and motivate. What is your feeling and how important this fellowship in your life? Can you please tell us until we get some question, please? Um, I think it's very important to for people to apply. I mean, I'm not the most outgoing person. And, and I was encouraged by one of our thoracic surgeons to do it. Um, it does involve uh, an amount of work, but it's so beneficial to do it and just to give you the opportunity to um, experience other areas um, throughout the NHS. We know that services differ um, in subtle ways between different hospitals and different areas. And it's just so interesting to go to a different place. Um, obviously, I stayed within the British Isles, but I know people go abroad. Um, just to see how services are provided elsewhere. Um, as I say, it, it is work I had to do the video and the report, but it's it's you get a sense of satisfaction um, from seeing your work printed, obviously to enter things like today. Um, and it gives you confidence, I think, if you just have to take that step, build your confidence up. Obviously, you can go with a group of other nurses so you can get their input, you can get support from them as well. Um, and it's just, it's, it gives you another string to your bow to say that you've actually done something like this. 
Yeah, thank you, Trudy. And just I want to insist to everyone, please, please, please apply. It's not only you have to come to Manchester. I know Manchester is not the nicest place. Trudy has selected. I'm so happy because I live in Manchester for 25 years. But you can go internationally. You can go anywhere nationally and other places, European countries. And what you are going to do is you are getting this fellowship. Look at what is lacking in your place and then go over there and find or learn something which is best and then bring it to the practice and disseminate your work. That is one of the important thing, this fellowship. And we try to do quarterly and we give at least four or five fellowship for every quarterly. Please, please apply. And thank you so much, Trudy. It is absolutely amazing. And I'm so happy that you have done. And let us move to the next presenter. Our next chair is Abu. Thank you, Abu. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Abu, we can't. Abu, we can't hear you. Please unmute. Okay, uh, Abu is having some technical difficulty. Please, Abu, log back and log back again. Abu, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Yeah, come back. Okay, just I'm going. Um, Zoe, can you able to introduce our next speaker, please? That's okay. I'm just going to introduce our second speaker is our Louise. Louise is one of my best friend and I know her nationally as well as a surgical care practitioner. She is going to talk about the setting up a surgical AF ablation follow-up clinic one year on from initial planning. Thank you so much for speaking, Louise. Presentation, please. Hello, my name is Louise Wiley-Lai. I'm a surgical care practitioner at Nottingham University Hospital. I would like to thank the SCTS for uh, allowing me to present today. My presentation is called Setting Up a Surgical AF Ablation Follow-Up Clinic One Year On from Initial Planning. We wanted to establish a comprehensive follow-up program for patients undergoing AF ablation surgery, whether this be a maze procedure or transarcophic maze. We saw the need to formally capture and document patient progress, monitoring rate and rhythm, and reviewing if further cardiological interventions required. Reviewing and reducing medication is required, such as antiarrhythmics and anticoagulants. We started the groundwork for setting up a pilot study in our centre in September 2019 and finally started our pilot programme in January 2020, reviewing our first patients that month. Things changed in March 2020 with COVID-19 and we had to quickly rethink how to continue the programme. Thank you to an INSQ fellowship last year. I spent a week in Brooklyn, New York at Mimondi's Hospital with their AF coordinator, Ginny, where I, they carry out hybrid AF ablation and a week in St. Louis at Washington University Hospital with their AF coordinator, Laurie and Dr. Damiano's team, where they carry out the maze procedure. The coordinator jobs are very different in the way that they were set out, but this is possibly because both centres are very different in demographics, geographics, unit size and procedures being carried out. I saw a patient at their annual follow-up in St. Louis had, who had received their initial surgical AF ablation treatment 12 years previously. This consistent follow-up is a great way of ensuring the best possible care for our patients, but also continues the flow of data collection in patients having undergone AF ablation surgery. The protocol surrounding the stopping of antiarrhythmics and anticoagulant drugs was also different in both centres. And this gave me a way to review data and an opportunity to learn from each centre and choose how to initialise setup for our pilot programme. In January 2020, we made contact with our first seven patients at their six-week surgical follow-up clinic. These first few patients were quickly highlighted changes and reviews that were needed to be made to our protocol. Simple things such as who is the correct person to request a cardioversion in the registrar or is this something the AF coordinator should be doing. Today we have set up a database for information collection based on the one being used in St. Louis. We have a patient information leaflet protocol for the stopping of antiarrhythmic and anticoagulant drugs, a performer for patient follow-up to be carried out in a multifaceted manner which is broken down into time frames for review. This table shows the way in which I broke down the process in the, into questions that require immediate 
immediate and initial answers. These will continue to be the questions that we review the most frequently from a patient care and business perspective. What we did find was that some patients less compliant to general follow-up, they engaged with the clinic follow-up and were encouraged to attend further consultant-led appointments which helped with their treatment and monitoring of care. We found that patients were positive about the continued contact and monitoring of symptoms and follow-up treatment. The pilot clinic protocol is being altered and added to on a working basis and will continue to be once face-to-face -face clinics resume. COVID, how COVID affected our clinic. I contacted all my patients. Fortunately, this was only a small number and discussed carrying out their follow-up by telephone. We'd not be able to request investigation for monitoring, but we'd use what we could. We collected data by asking patients to pass on any information regarding ECGs or monitoring being done by their GP, heart failure nurses or hospital admissions, taking pulses and describing if it was regular or irregular and telling me their beats per minute. Some patients managed to borrow smartwatches from relatives and related information gained from them. It has, however, put back our planned protocol regarding anticoagulant antirhythmics as we do not have the appropriate documented information to do this safely due to stopping of elective investigations during COVID-19. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Louise. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Yes, hi. Okay. <laughs> it was it was a nice presentation, definitely. But I think due to COVID nineteen, um, everything was a little bit messed up. Yes. Overall. So so my uh, first question to you: um, mm -hmm. Who will be running this clinic from the nurse practitioner's point of view, or from the um, surgeons or the cardiologist, or it will be a team effort for the clinic? Um, the the physical clinic will is currently being run by myself, who's a surgical care practitioner. Okay. Obviously, um, my consultant surgeons have input if there's any irregularities with their patients, if there's any questions mm. that I have, any investigations that I fear I feel haven't been carried out, and I know were requested or should be carried out, or mm. if it's worth suggesting it being carried out, I can highlight these to the consultants. We would like long term and it had been our plan to involve I'm in Nottingham so we have a quite a spread out area we cover Lincoln and Kings Mill and mm -hmm. um, Derbyshire so we have cardiologists in all these different centres so the idea mm -hmm. is to present to all the cardiologists and give mm -hmm. them a full understanding of the programme that we've set up what we plan to for the patients to gain from this and hopefully we can work hand in hand as a team with them so that patients who live in Derbyshire don't need to come to Nottingham to have an ECG done. They can mm. go to their local cardiology department and have it done, who will then follow on the information to me on the system and I can follow up these patients that way. As mm. it's been standing just now, we've just been phoning patients um, and they've, they've, really, they've really responded well to that. Okay, that's good, that's very nice. Um, so you are planning to restart the pilot project again after I mean, this COVID era or you have already started again? We we never stopped. Oh, never stopped. We, okay. we didn't stop operating. Okay. So we, we weren't carrying out very many ablations during COVID-19. I think maybe I could count on one hand how many we carried out in a 12-month period. Yeah. But since our numbers have um, ramped up, uh, sufficiently I think we've added I think we're now about 30 patients which okay. if you think that the, the program's only been running a year mm -hmm. just over a year and we've had almost a year's hiatus I think we've done actually exceptionally well and um, so mm -hmm. although I say restarting it we'll certainly be reviewing it and when we manage to face-to-face -face clinics again if we decide to go down that route, because we may stick with telephone clinics, if that's working and just bring patients in on a face-to-face -face basis mm -hmm. as required, that works financially. It works um, because our patients are from outlying areas. It works for them from a distance and travel perspective. And that is how we've been doing it at the moment. We've had a few patients who um, we've requested to come back in to have reviews of sternums or cardio versions, but these have been done on a one-to-one -one specific basis. That's good. That's good. What is the patient's response? Because uh, usually they have to wait for a longer time for regular follow-up, post-surgical things. But 
as you have separated the f ablation surgical patient separately so i think now they are getting uh, appointment quicker than usual so what yeah. is the response about that they yeah, most of obviously most of my patients are later in life in years so a lot of them enjoy having a chat with somebody okay. like to have that person who they now know they know my name they they go oh, hi how are you how are the kids <laughs> you know they know who, who i am and to have someone check in because i check in every three months to one year and then it will be annually after that so mm -hmm. eventually we're going to have to need a team if we continue and um, mm -hmm. carrying out as many F ablations as we are at the mm -hmm. moment mm -hmm. and they love that and they also know that i'm there so i have a patient who with covid seems to have not fall into the cracks but has been delayed and delayed and delayed but because i've got that contact i can go to the consultant's door and say hi i've spoken to this guy this week he's really really failing and I'm, I'm actually very concerned can we start this up in some way what can i do to facilitate this and he said order this investigation of that investigation order once they're in let's look at it again and see what we can do and i i, I feel very validated in, the, yeah. in that perspective because i really feel that our patients are, are doing well for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really believe it's a good um, um, plan to go ahead with and I will wish that you will publish more data on about it and so that the other centers can follow this sort of clinic plans and definitely it will be a very good initiative for every other trusting hospital. I agree. I think it's fantastic and I want to be yeah. here for anyone who has any questions, anyone who wants to set something like this up. Yeah. You don't need to jump as many hoops as I have. You can take the ones I've already jumped and I'll learn from you and you can learn from me. I think it's great for every patient. I totally agree. Yeah, thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You for your time. Thank you, Abu. Thank you, Louise. Uh, Zoe, would you like to introduce the next speaker, please? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bhavana. Um, can we just remind everyone just to have a um, put a few questions in the chat because everyone's been a little bit quiet this morning. Um, so our next chat is by Professor Julie Sanders and she's going to be talking on um, increasing research opportunities for nursing and allied health professions within the cardiac surgery. So we'll start Julie's presentation. Many thanks to the FDTF and also the Ionesco family for the opportunity for me to visit Canada to look at increasing research opportunities for nurses and allied professions in cardiac surgery. Um, as part of my day job, I'm Director of Clinical Research at St. Bartholomew's Hospital and also Clinical Professor of Cardiovascular Nursing at Queen Mary University of London. Just to give some background, um, St. Bartholomew's Hospital is one of the oldest hospitals in the UK, one of the largest cardiovascular centres in Europe and treats over 80,000 patients a year. Similarly, QMUL is one of the leading research universities ranked fifth in the UK and the William Harvey Research Institute is an internationally acknowledged centre of excellence in the field of cardiovascular research and therapeutic innovation. And my role over both of these institutions is to develop research and clinical academic opportunities for nurses and allied professions. And this is because we know that research active organisations have improved patient outcomes and patient competence um, is increased in staff. And there are many national and international nursing bodies that recognise that engaging nurses in research is essential for the provision of safe, high quality care. However, the number of doctorally prepared nurses is low. They need 0.2% of USA nurses and 0.1% of UK nurses have a PhD. And certainly within cardiac surgery, this is um, significantly lower as within cardiac surgery itself, which is considered the unborn child of global surgery. There's a lack of provision in providing worldwide health care. So back in the day when we were allowed to travel, um, I visited Professor Suzanne Fredericks, who is based at the Daphne Cockrell School of Nursing at Ryerson University in Toronto, um, to look at engaging in international collaboration, um, as she is also a cardiac surgery researcher. And our aim really was to look at exploring opportunities for cardiothoracic research collaboration and to plan a programme of work. So my trip involved a number of meetings. I met with academics from Ryerson University. I met with clinicians and clinical academics at the Peter Monk Cardiac Centre, 
Witt is a world-class leader in simpler and complex cardiovascular diseases um, and is based within Toronto General Hospital, which is one of the oldest hospitals in um, Toronto. I met with patients, specifically those um, with aortic dissection um, Canada. I met with the president of the Canadian Council of Cardiovascular Nurses. Um, we visited Health Quality Ontario, which is um, the, where all the national data is, or the um, Ontario data is held, um, which is equivalent of our NICOR. And we also met with the British Journal of Cardiac Nursing Editor-in-Chief, who um, interestingly is based in Toronto. And so our programme of work that came out of these visits was that we are collaborating on a project looking at frailty in cardiac surgery. We are looking at developing the research priorities um, within Canada in the same way that we've done so in the UK. Um, and this be intentional actually that this will aid um, joint working. We've been collaborating with the president of the Canadian Council um, and they have worked with us on a number of CERN related COVID projects. And we've also um, engaged the patients who've contributed to a successful grant application. One of the things that we've done is um, worked with other colleagues um, in Australia and the USA and have done a six paper series um, to highlight cardiac surgery nursing. We've done an introduction paper, one on advanced practice, clinical academic careers, student perspectives, patient experience and international visiting teams. And these have all now been published. To follow on from this work, we're also developing an international network specifically for nurses and allied professions who are interested in developing cardiac surgery research. And this will launch formally um, in June of this year. So overall, it's been a very successful and productive trip, which again, I would like to thank the SDTS and the ISQ family um, for the opportunity to, to do this and um, to undertake the work. Um, many thanks indeed. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Julie. And it's nice to have you um, here again. I think you can see some more nerves um, into research, whether it's cardiac or the thoracic field. What, there isn't many questions coming in, so I just wondered um, what you think the benefits are of the sort of international collaboration. Um, nursing and HPs, because I think medics do it very well, but um, I think nursing and HPs, we need to take more of the lead like you have. Yeah, yeah. Um, I agree. One of, oh, I'm sorry, there's a lot of additional noise. Um, okay. um, one of the key things about international collaborations is that um, it's, it's international collaborations that actually the journals and um, getting a much more robust research protocol and um, delivery is needed. So actually one of the ways of increasing evidence, particularly in a pool where there are very small numbers of nurses and allied professions, and actually even surgeons that are clinical academics in this field is one of the ways um, is to increase that capacity is by doing so and collaborating internationally. So because we have such a small pool relative to um, other countries as well within the UK of surgeons and nurses and allied professional academics, the, the way to build out the quality of our research evidence is to collaborate um, internationally. I think you're on mute, Zoe. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. Sorry. Um, quite a few people are asking about um, where would you start um, your sort of research journey? Because a lot of people are saying they haven't got huge amounts of experience within research. Um, so have you got any advice on how people can um, sort of start their research journey? Uh, of course. So um, one way is to find out um, locally who your nat 
are your local champions for research are. So maybe your local um, uh, principal investigators of studies um, and uh, people that are engaged in research and so maybe nurses or al other allied professions in your clinical research delivery team. Um, and they'll be able to give you some kind of tips and um, maybe some opportunities to work with them, maybe on a small scale just to build up your experience. Um, then there is also obviously the nurse SCTS Nursing and Allied Professional um, Research Group, um, the NARG, um, and that is supposed to be building, and we are building a community of those that are interested in research at all levels. So um, do contact us through the new website. Um, am I plugging it well enough, Zoe? Um, uh, <laughs> Clinton and yourself would be proud. Um, through the new SDCS website, do get in touch and we'd be very happy to provide some um, opportunities and some advice as to how to proceed maybe locally um, in, in particular. And we will be doing a um, webinar in September about how to maybe start on your clinical academic journey. So if you're interested, then please look out for that as well and we'll give some more wisdom, hopefully, and practical experience from, um, from some of our PhD students as to how people have been able to um, uh, get, get started. Yeah, no, I think um, I think everyone will agree. Uh, sometimes it is just about shadowing or just having a bit of work experience with, say, someone already in research can just give you that um, um, opportunity to sort of start with in research. And um, yeah, the SETS's new website um, gives a lot more information about um, how we can get uh, more nursing and AHPs into research. Um, just really quickly before we finish um, your session, Julia, a few people have just said, how can they be involved with um, Connect and is it possible for other people to, to join you? In Connect, was that, sorry? Yeah, that. in the Connect, so, yeah. So definitely can join in Connect and you've obviously seen our tweets um, today, which is um, fantastic. Um, we were launching Connect at the Euro Heart Care Conference, which is the European Society of Cardiology um, uh, Nursing and Allied Profession Congress. Um, and so to find out more about that, please sign up to the Congress and come to the launch on the 19th of June. Um, more information will be available after that, but that's where the key launch will be. So please do join us there. Super, thank you ever so much, Julie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you, Zoe. Let's move to our next presenter. Our next presenter is Jonathan. He is going to talk about the lung ultrasound in critical care unit. Thank you. Presentation, please. Hello, uh, welcome to this uh, presentation on lung ultrasound in CIC. My name is Jonathan Johnston one of the advanced clinical practitioners in cardiac surgery uh, for 2017 to 2020 at the Royal Sussex County Hospital. I've actually moved on. Uh, I work in Dumfries in acute medicine as an advanced nurse practitioner now. Um, but I was the coordinator for the fellowship, the INESCU fellowship um, in 2019, uh, which we explored lung ultrasound in the CIC. Uh, so just a bit of background, um, a group of eight um, ACPs introduced in 2016 in the Royal Sussex County Hospital. Um, we've been there, it was a new project uh, in 2016 and as part of embedding in and, and becoming a fully fledged service, we were encouraged to learn as many sort of new skills as possible. And one of those skills um, <clears throat> That our clinical supervisor was very keen for us to learn his lung ultrasound. He had been he had become interested in himself, uh, Dr. Robert Kong. Um, so we did a, a number of things. Uh, we started to try it out and uh, with Dr. Kong as a supervisor, and we became really interested in its benefits, uh, lung ultrasound. And um, we ran a small scale pilot study comparing chest X rays uh, to lung ultrasound for. The four most common lung pathologies often encountered in the CICU, pleural effusion, pulmonary edema, interstitial fluid, uh, consolidation, and pneumothorax. Um, and we presented this pilot study at SCTS and EACT and STS conferences over the years of 2018. Um, and that, that was a really great experience as well to try and, you know, 
get some feedback from other people around the world really um, in, in using lung ultrasound in this context. And in fact, we found that many people had already uh, started using it and were keen to hear more uh, about it also. Um, so the outcome of the pilot study was, you know, pretty clear that lung ultrasound was, you know, as good as chest x-ray. And, and the way we did that was we compared um, lung ultrasound with chest x-ray and we showed them to the consultant anesthetists and they would make a diagnosis based on both of them <clears throat> blindly. Um, and it came out that, you know, it was able, they were able to find the correct diagnosis with pretty much both um, imaging modalities equally, really. Um, although it was just a pilot study, so the sample size was very small and didn't have any statistical significance, but there was ample previous research to highlight lung ultrasound as being useful in this context. So for that reason, and after a lot of discussion about what we do about it, how we move forward, um, we decided that we would apply for the INSCU Fellowship uh, for Nursing and uh, Allied Health Professionals. And we were very excited to be able to secure that fellowship in 2019. Um, that's just a picture of us at the STS conference. And uh, that's my colleagues, Heidi and Louise. Um, and that was when we were presenting the pilot study. So just moving on to the INSCU Fellowship. Um, our plan was to spend time in a recognized center of excellence uh, for lung ultrasound and critical care. Um, we did try and find one in the UK to go along with the one that we had already had in mind in, in Northern Italy. Uh, but we were unable to sort of secure that. It just, it, it didn't, um, the timings and I think people's availability and the people that we contacted, it didn't work out, um, which, which is fine. I mean, it, you know, these things, um, can often be quite difficult to organize. Uh, but thankfully, we were able, able to find a colleague who was able to help uh, deliver the training that we needed. And, th and that was uh, Dr. Luigi Fertrino of um, Udine Hospital in Italy. Um, and he was known to our clinical supervisor, Dr. Kong, and they discussed lung ultrasound previously, and he'd published a lot of papers on lung ultrasound, and he used it very readily in his own unit every day and that's what we were interested in doing and making it um part of everyday assessment um so it seemed like a good fit for us and uh he was a very friendly guy when we contacted him and and we took it from there and in june 2019 dr patrino arrived in brighton and he delivered his first teaching session <clears throat> it was very detailed and covered all of the introductory information that we would need including things like the physics of ultrasound and the machine settings and the history of ultrasound, in fact, uh, which was really, really interesting to learn. And uh, he was a very passionate advocate for its use um, by us, the AMP team. Um, and then he obviously went on to discuss uh, diagnosis and pattern recognition, uh, including the use of artifacts to, you know, the, the, there are artifacts that are created by ultrasound um, that actually you know, they don't relate to anatomy, but rather than a, um, a change that causes an artifact in the image that you're seeing, and you have to be able to recognize that, uh, and that helps you rule in or rule out diagnosis. Um, I won't go into it in, in detail with this uh, presentation, because this is more about the fellowship and, and how we um, and how we sort of embedded the, the learning that we, we had there. Um, so in the evening, uh, after the, the session, we were able to get together and um, ask him loads of questions. We had millions of questions and he was great. And he, you know, discussed at length all the things that we had learned during that day uh, with this fantastic detailed session on lung ultrasound. And then the next part was for us to go to Italy um, in Udine Hospital and spend time on his critical care unit. Uh, six of us were able to go. Um, between September uh, and November 2019. And we went to the, uh, it was a general critical care unit, but they did have cardiac patients and uh, some very complex uh, transplant patients. And um, we were able to observe the use of lung ultrasound in context. Um, 
So each group would spend two full days with Dr. Petrino and his team, um, which was fantastic. I mean, we were made to feel extremely welcome in Edenay Hospital. And we were all really impressed by the expertise of, of both the medical and nursing and um, allied health professionals that we met there. Um, it was a fantastic unit in a, in a very big uh, hospital, which served a very big area, and it, it was just a fantastic experience for, for everybody that went. Um, so just to go through a little bit of what the day was like uh, for us when we were there, um, in Udine, the critical care ward rounds are attended by a very similar team uh, to UK hospitals. So there's, you know, a registrar, a consultant, junior doctor and uh, the nurse in charge. And then, you know, you go to each bed and speak to the, the bedside nurse. And, um, but what really uh, struck me straight away was the fact that the registrar would perform a focused assessment um, using lung ultrasound um, and including a focused echo on every single patient uh, on the ward round. And, and it was just great because everybody was used to seeing it. <clears throat> they were able, able to understand the images uh, that they were looking at and uh, you know we could all discuss them as part of a team and very kindly uh, Dr. Virginia would translate everything that was being said because it was all in Italian but um, but it was a fantastic experience and, uh, and really impressive to see the way that they integrated ultrasound into their day. Um, and obviously um, uh, throughout each uh, scan uh, Dr. Rodrigo would take us through the finer details of, of the probe pl placement and the settings and, you know, how they're going to use that information to progress the care of the patient. Um, he was a big advocate of um, using it for fluid assessment, for instance. So, you know, are you giving the patient too much fluid? You can check their lungs every day and you can actually give them a score um, and then you can sort of back off on fluids and it was really very impressive uh, the way he'd integrated it into the care of each patient. Um, and this way of learning for us was a, of huge benefit um, because we were able to sort of understand the best ways to implement uh, what we wanted to do and when to implement it. There's often a difficulty when you're learning new things, uh, when to use it and in what context. And this, this really gave us the, the idea that we could when to do it. <clears throat> um, and he also talked about some uh, some wisdom regarding resistance to change because often when you introduce a new service, especially in the NHS, people are very skeptical about, you know, what's it going to cost or is it useful? Is it going to waste time and all those sort of things? So he, he was able to go through uh, some pearls of wisdom about how to handle that as well, which was really great. Uh, so once we were back in Brighton, we, you know, we were given this task of really doing as many long ultrasounds as we possibly could. And um, we're given about six, six weeks to really get to grips with things and sort of kind of keep a little diary in our head or questions that we wanted to ask, difficulties that we'd had uh, when performing scans. And, um, and then in January 2020, uh, Dr. Rodrigo returned to Brighton for final comments and questions, and we were able to... Um, go through all of the questions that we had and the difficulties and he was able to, to take us through it. Um, and I think that's what that, it just made it such a great experience was the to and fro and the way that he had organized it um, was absolutely fantastic. Um, and he also provided a last lecture um, on lung ultrasound, took all our questions, excuse me. And then um, he also did a, a final lecture on focused echo and critical care to sort of enthuse us to take our learning further and, and, and learn about focused echo uh, for our patients also, which we were really, really grateful for. Uh, so the outcome of all this is that, um, you know, we faced some difficulty when we first started talking about lung ultrasound, as I mentioned, um, but obviously doing the fellowship and doing lots of scans around the seat around the unit and being seen to do scans and talk about scans um it very quickly became oh we heard the phrase can you just do a quick ultrasound on this patient that became very familiar and much to our delight really because that's that's what we wanted to to get out of it and we wanted to be useful um 
for the team and for the patients. And uh, I think that this really highlights the benefit of lung ultrasound and critical care is that sometimes uh, you got a little suspicion that someone might be fluid overloaded or, you know, their bases sound quiet. Um, but, you know, there's a number of things that can go on with CICU patients and they, sometimes they're not very um, stable cardiovascularly. Moving them onto a chest x-ray plate, all these sort of things can cause um, anxiety and it, it can be difficult to, uh, logistically, it can be difficult. Whereas lung ultrasound is really straightforward and easy and you've got easy access to it. Most critical care units will have a lung ultrasound, uh, well, an ultra ultrasound machine that's capable of uh, performing a, a lung ultrasound scan uh, readily. Um, so yeah, it's, its advantages are that it's a quick and easy uh, imaging modality that can be shared with others immediately. There's no radiation exposure for the patient, obviously. Um, it uses unit staff, so we don't need to get someone from outside to come in and do it. Although, you know, uh, we should be aware that there are limitations to lung ultrasound. So if, you, if you're noticing something uh, in one of your scans that doesn't look familiar, um, we would definitely suggest getting a follow-up you know, diagnostic level imaging by a radiographer and having that reviewed by a radiologist. Um, focused lung ultrasound doesn't, um, it's only useful in a very sort of small context. Uh, there's a small window of sort of pathologies that it's useful for. However, for those lung pathologies, it is actually, it does have good sensitivity and specificity and, and that's sort of widely recognized. Disadvantages, um, obviously you can't see the whole lung field. Uh, you're seeing little snapshots of it. So it's a bit different from a chest x-ray in that point of view. You're also unable to view bones. It just, uh, bones just appear as a dark shadow. You don't get any information about them. Um, you can scan the mediastinum, but you don't see it in the same context as you do um, in a chest x-ray. So, um, you know, I think with these things and you don't see the cardiac shadow either, um, I think these things, is, when we had conversations with the surgeons and particularly uh, on our unit, um, it was very much, it's not going to replace a chest x-ray, but rather be, um, you know, an adjunct that can be used, you know, alongside um, chest x-rays. And, and maybe um, you'd be able to reduce the amount of chest x-rays that you requested. Um, it does require a, a extra training, although it's pretty straightforward for people who, uh, take an interest in and in have an, a basic understanding of the anatomy um, that they're looking at. Um, and this is probably the, the biggest problem with it is um, it can be very difficult to obtain uh, useful images in patients with challenging body habitus um, or, you know, patients who have multiple um, you know, uh, if they had bilateral chest strains and a sternal wound and you know the, the sort of images you're getting there could be difficult to interpret um, and, and in that situation it's absolutely uh, fine to get a chest x-ray for obviously. Yes thank you. Our next presentation is on collaborative approach to enhance recovery in thoracic surgery by Michel Gibb. Um, I would like to welcome Michel Gibb with his presentation, please. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michelle Gibb. I'm a clinical specialist physiotherapist who works in thoracic surgery at Glenfield Hospital in Leicester. Um, today, I'd like to present myself and my colleagues work, um, a collaborative approach to enhance recovery um, from which we were able to um, look into a little bit more because we were lucky enough to be, to be awarded the SCTS INSQ AHP Fellowship in 2019. So this is who we are. So we applied for the fellowship because um, as an MDT, we are developing our enhanced recovery program. And from previous benchmarking we've done, we were aware of other centres across the UK who've been very successful in implementing their enhanced recovery program. The aim was to visit key centres in the UK to shadow and understand how successful enhanced recovery programmes have been implemented, but also maintained. So as you can see here, we really wanted to look at that whole patient journey of enhanced recovery and how other centres made that work. 
So we were lucky enough to visit four centres in the UK. So we visited Birmingham Heartlands, Southampton, John Radcliffe in Oxford and Guy's in London. So what have we learned? So just to give you some of the key things, because um, I could talk to you all day about this. Um, so pre-admissions, we really found that successful pre-admission clinics were one-stop clinics where um, patients were able to gain the relevant information from a, um, a variety of MDT members um, and for making it work as well, having, the rel having enough space to do so and designated slots for investigations as well, such as echoes, CTs, x-rays, really made it flow and work well. Um, we did identify with, um, with the other centres we visited that prehab was a key area for future development for all our enhanced recovery programmes. Um, some barriers that we'd found so far to it had been um, funding, staffing levels, geographical areas for patients and the time frame to get patients into prehab. Um, but it was agreed that this was a really key area for future development. So we found the success of same day admissions were really facilitated by an admissions lounge, which was, a, which was allowed patients to, to come in, were prepped for surgery and were able to go down for surgery, allowing flow on the ward as well. We really saw how walking to theatre was implemented as well, um, really encompassing that enhanced recovery of getting better sooner and being up and mobile sooner as well. Um, we found that patients came from greater distances and if they, were, they came into hospital on that same day, um, or they stayed in local hospitals the night before, um, local hotel, sorry. So post-operative care, so we learn ever so much from this, but just to summarise, we found that paravertebrals were the main use of post-op analgesia. We really saw how enhanced staffing levels really facilitated enhanced recovery. So things like early drain removals and just meant everything flowed that little bit quicker and really helped that patient get better and home sooner. Um, digital chest drains were used. Um, we saw how specialist nurses and physiotherapists provided discharge talks to patients and the opportunity for patients to answer questions. We saw patients that came back from theatre with minimal attachments, so no IVs or A-lines. Um, we did see that the physiotherapy cover varied between centres, but again, all agreed that day zero mobilisation um, was an area for future development or just continued building onto it. Um, which would be a really exciting area to see, hopefully really, again, building on that enhanced recovery. So post-operative and follow-up care. So we saw initially um, post-operative appointments were with the operating consultant, but we really saw how nurse-led clinics or nurse-led drain clinics could be implemented and how successful they were. Um, and we saw that even pre-COVID-19 pandemic, that um, there were follow-up phone calls, virtual telemed clinics as well being implemented really successfully. So research and audit, we saw the, um, a really great plethora of studies that undertaken and um, specific research nurses allocated to studies and some centres had a designated research team, including um, members like data managers, which really helped them take their research to the next level. Um, studies also cross covered surgery and oncology as well. So we explored different roles and we saw in particular advanced nurse practitioner had different roles in, ver in different trusts. So some varied from more outpatient clinic based to um, some who were more inpatient and part of the medical team as well, which was very interesting. Um, we were able to share some of our knowledge, so some of our complex cases and just a little bit more about our unit and how we work. Um, and we developed a quality improvement Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for coming. And Zoe, would you like to um, yeah. introduce our next presenter, please? Thank you. Yeah, so we have Catherine Hewitt, um, who's going to be talking about the implementation of the QEHB Advanced Clinical Practitioner-led Autovascular Service. We'll start her presentation. Hello and welcome to my talk today on the implementation of the QEACP-led Autovascular Service. I'd like to start by thanking you all for tuning in today to listen to this and also to the society for this opportunity to talk to you all. 
So the QE aortovascular service refers to and includes surveillance of patients diagnosed with aortopathy requiring surgical intervention and patients following surgical intervention. As we know, aortic patients often require multiple interventions, therefore placing a huge emphasis on surveillance and close monitoring spanning their lifetime. The service at the QE began back in 2008 and was set up by Prof Bonser, and the operations include utilisation of the frozen elephant trunk and thoraco abdominal aortic operations. Currently, we have around 890 patients being reviewed within the service, 67 of which are thoraco abdominal, and we pre perform around 90 aortic procedures per year. Historically, the aortovascular service at the QE is MDC led. Uh, images of each patient get reviewed at a multidisciplinary team meeting each week and a letter of results and plan moving forward is then sent to patients with minimal contact and communication with patients themselves. We're also very lucky at the QE to have a genetic aortopathy clinic that is well established with around 630 patients being reviewed and followed up in, over the last 10 years. In order to review the service, we sent out a questionnaire to 30 consecutive patients looking at patient experience. And the results of this showed that there's a wide variation in the number of times patients are seen in clinic with a total of 13% having never been seen in clinic and 20% thinking that they don't know who to contact if they were to have any concerns. 30% of patients asked found their communication with the service to be poor or very poor. And the majority of patients said that, yes, they do like having a letter, but they also would rather have a telephone conversation or a discussion in person alongside this to discuss the results. Although there were lots of very good reviews, um, the questionnaire also showed us that the letters that we used had terminology or jargon that patients didn't understand and they would have liked to have had the opportunity to discuss this with a medical professional. Our aims therefore were to implement an ACP-led surveillance service to improve communication. So therefore implementation of the service, we identified an aortic team creating a rotational post throughout the aortic advanced practitioners, uh, providing specialist in-house training, and we worked collegiately as a team to write and implement aortic management and imaging protocols. We provided a virtual clinic which started back in June 2020. We attend the MDTs regularly each week to present patient symptom and concern, looking at diagnosis, educational counselling, and implementation of discharge talks. We formulated the Birmingham Aortovascular Surgery Information Booklet, and also increase our involvement with the QE Genetic Aortopathy Clinic to increase our understanding of the genetic element and improve on education that we provide our patients. We then sent out the same questionnaire to 30 more patients, looking at how the implementation of these things have improved our service. So what we showed is that 100% of patients asked said that their communication with the aortic team was either very good or excellent, and we received a 10 out of 10 for our service. So in conclusion, the early results of our ACP-led aortovascular service has enhanced patient experience at the QE, improving specifically in areas of patient education, communication, blood pressure management, timely referral to other specialities for symptom management, and expedition of patients through the pathway as necessary, therefore reducing stress and anxiety of patients and their families. Moving forward, we're looking at publication of our patient information booklet, yearly and continual reviews of the protocols and the service that we've implemented, increasing staff education on aortopathies and what we should be educating the patients on, we're looking at the introduction of QE Aortic Dissection Awareness Day and also publication of our master's research surrounding the service improvement. Thank you for listening.
Brilliant. Thank you so much, Catherine. And we do apologise. We've run, o- run over a little bit of time. So we're just going to go back to Michelle just to ask um, a question um, that's come in um, from the panel. So, um, Michelle, there's just been a few questions um, populated about what so we have um, services. Did you observe and what did um, they involve? Of course, yeah, it was a really interesting topic. So um, one thing we did agree with the services services we visited that it was something we'd like to do, but not a lot had things up and running. So when we went to Birmingham, they were probably the most advanced and had they were developing their Fit for Surgery app. Um, which sort of in-house they'd had some really good results with. It sounded fantastic. I think they just were at the early stages, but utilising technology was really interesting. And this was all done pre-COVID pandemic. So it'd be really interesting now to see how we utilise technology a lot more. Um, And then other services had done things like classes, um, but just really struggled because of staffing or funding. It was often pulled from sort of your main physio team who had a main responsibility to the inpatient side of the service so it was really difficult so definitely an area to kind of overcome barriers um but as like a collective i think in thoracic surgery and particularly in physio but in heart recovery is the area that re- people really want to develop next brilliant thank you ever so much Cheryl. yeah i think we can all agree that there's such a variety of um of what centres do in terms of prehab and the evidence is still quite limited um, out there. So it's great that you've been able to see a variety of centres. Um, and just quickly going on to Catherine, um, in terms of um, what sort of what you've implemented, people have just been asking what challenges um, have you had to sort of overcome in order to be able to internet such a sort of specific service yeah i think sorry can you hear me okay yeah yeah i think um the biggest well there's always a challenge when any change is put in place um so i think it's really important to um, engage the stakeholders the important people in the organization and get their buy-in so that everyone is on board everyone wants the change to happen um and that's probably the easiest way to do it and I, I echo uh, what Tara spoke about this morning in one of our plenary sessions. And I think that for any of these changes to happen, to have a really good consultant focus and support from our consultant body is, is really, really important. And I think that was key for us to be able to set the service up at the QA. Brilliant, thank you, Catherine. Um, because of time, we will just have to move on. So we do apologize. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you, Zoe. It's a very nice presentation. Thank you, Michelle, as well. Just I really want to apologize because we couldn't be able to take any questions from Jonathan. Jonathan has a clinical commitment and he couldn't be able to join us. And let us move to the next presenter, Una from Liverpool, a heart and chest hospital. And she is going to talk about how to set up a nurse-led IoT visual clinic. Thank you. Presentation, please. Hello all, my name is Una. I am the Aortic Advanced Practitioner at Liverpool Heart and Chest Hospital. Hello. I am going to talk to you today about how how our virtual aortic clinic was developed. And just to emphasize that this was pre-COVID times. The long-term nature of follow-up for aortic patients led to the accumulation of large numbers exceeding clinic capacity. This led to patient dissatisfaction with long delays to attend brief appointments for imaging results, which begged the question, could this not be done over the phone? With no existing virtual clinic model for an aortic clinic, we had to establish safety, need and acceptability to patients. As a result, a survey was undertaken to ascertain patients' preference for clinic appointments, and attitudes towards nurse-led clinic. Interestingly, 83% stated they would be satisfied with a telephone consultation and 81% were satisfied to speak to a specialist nurse rather than a doctor. These results prompted the implementation of a virtual clinic. The appropriate patients were moved into the new virtual clinic. 
Sounds good so far, doesn't it? However, an audit of patients booked into the virtual clinic was undertaken and three main areas were identified as being problematic. These were patient logistics, investigations and administrative. So the logistics, we found 30% of the clinic was utilised only and 52% of patients were inappropriately placed in the virtual clinic. A referral system was redesigned, uh, patient imaging protocols introduced. Large numbers of investigations were not ordered or booked after the virtual clinic date or not available for the appointment. All patients requiring an echo appointment were given one for the same day and time as the virtual clinic appointment, which defeated the entire object. To rectify this, it required engagement with a multitude of people, medics, radiology, and cardiac diagnostics, in addition to the introduction of a robust clinic check. A programme of nurse education was introduced for the advanced practitioner and negotiation with radiology to allow uh, led ordering of CT and MRI scans. found a 30% DNA rate and letters were sent with correct appointment times or asking the patients to physically attend. To rectify this, it required engagement with a multitude of staff and managers, secretaries and clinic admin staff. The clinic appointment letter was redesigned. A postal survey was undertaken to ascertain the opinions of patients who experienced the virtual clinic. This yielded a high response rate, 65%, and 97% of patients preferred virtual clinic as opposed to face-to-face -face clinic. There were a variety of positive comments as seen. The successful implementation of the virtual clinic meant that there was already with infrastructure to safely manage outpatients remotely when COVID-19 arrived. This created confidence within the team that enabled us to adapt more readily to rapidly changing circumstances, which also saw the introduction of video consultations. Patients have guided us at every stage, firstly with their dissatisfaction in the previous clinic, secondly with useful suggestions regarding how to best run the virtual clinic. With further improvements, we continue to improve the virtual clinic structure and we are looking towards an app-based model for the future. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Yuna, for your presentation. I can understand that you are unable to attend due to your clinic com uh, commitments. And we will move to next presenter. Abu, would you like to? Abu, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, our next presentation is on INSCO Fellowship 2019, A Visit to Texas by Amy. I would like to invite Amy with the presentation to come forward, please. Hi, I'm Amy Willichape, and this is my colleague Caroline Parry, and we are presenting our INSCO Fellowship 2019 award uh, where we made a visit to Texas. The Heart and Vascular Institute in Houston, Texas opened in 2008 and it is led by Hazim Safi and Anthony Estrera. It is one of the top heart and vascular programs in the United States and it is internationally renowned for aortic aneurysm repair and reconstruction. Aortic operations include open surgeries for valve sparing aortic root replacement, 
arch and thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm repair. The service is also combined with surgeons performing percutaneous interventions for aortic dissections such as TVAR and EVAR. An overview of their service. So their day routine, surgery, ICU and wards day are very similar to that of the UK. Differences include the type of healthcare system, uh, which is prioritised in the US, and this has an impact on the hospital. It's often more like a hotel. Healthcare funding and insurance policy can impact on certain aspects of care, one of which is medication choice. An example of this is the use of the $4 Walmart drug list, which is available across most of the US. Um, so that would offer patients with less insurance cover um, alternative drug treatment. So perhaps instead of having aspirin and clopidogrel or aspirin and ticagrelor, um, they might have a double dose of aspirin or perhaps instead of being treated with a DOAC, um, like a Pixaban, a uh, warfarin would be used as an alternative. Scans are reviewed by the surgeon and not by a radiologist. A diagram and performer is completed at the Heart and Vascular Institute to ensure that there is a record of aortic dimensions available at all times. The aortic team don't review all of their patients at the MDT due to the vast amount of referrals received and only review genetic and congenital patients. The service didn't have a specific aortic ACP and all patients were managed alongside routine cardiac surgery. And the outpatient clinics were carried out with an ACP and a surgeon twice per week. And this aided real time decision making and teaching for the ACP. So comparisons between the US and here, we didn't collect any data from the service at their request. And even if we had, it would have been difficult to compare an NHS trust and program in the United States due to the private versus public aspect of healthcare and both the size of the hospital, state and the country. Length of stay in the United States is often shorter in the private healthcare. Um, virtual clinics there are not favourable as they don't generate as much income. Unless the surgeons are seeing patients face to face, they are unable to charge the same tariffs. Remote review of clinical presentation and scans is not favourable also for the same reason. Everything they do is linked to tariff and cost. So the development of the QE's aortic service, I won't go into too much detail because there's a couple of presentations about this later on, um, but essentially two members of the existing team were allocated to the aortic ACP role, allowing cover of the following. Introduction of ACP presence at the MDT, which is recently split into two types of MDT. An MDT with a wider range of specialties, including vascular and radiology, every other week for new referrals and a smaller MDT with the aortic surgeons for patients under surveillance who are fairly stable. Mm -hmm. Setup of a virtual clinic with associated income generation. This was initially prior to the MDT but is now for specific questions raised at the MDT and for all new patients and patients discharged from the service. New protocols, documentation and patient information booklets are being updated and developed. Finally, we just want to say thank you, especially to Mr. Ionescu and the SCTS for allowing us this fantastic opportunity. Thank you to Assistant Professor of Vascular Surgery, Rana Afifi, for organising our timetable. To Dr. Estrera for allowing us to shadow your clinics and letting us come and watch you in the operating theatre. And finally, to Professor and Founding Chair, Hazim Safi, for welcoming us to your unit. Hi, Amy. Hi, Amy. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Amy? Amy, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. OK. So it was a nice presentation. I hope you had a very good time in your fellowship travel thing. Just a quick question for you. What do you think? What is the difference of role between uh, the in, in the advanced care practitioners in between UK and USA? Um, well, we found um, where at the QE, we kind of uh, were all in one team and not one of us does a pre-admission clinic and one of us does post-op care. We, we all work together um, and certain members of that team have then stepped into the aortic ACP role, which is rotating. Um, but we found there 
they'd have one ACP that did the ward, one ACP that would do intensive care, one ACP that would do aortic. Um, similar aspects of, I suppose, everything they did in terms of daily routine was very similar to that of the UK, but perhaps were just more separate within their roles. But other than that, it's very similar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Due to time constraint, I think we'll go on next one. So I would like to request Joey to uh, present for the next presenter. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Um, yeah, so our last um, presentation is by Sally Singh, and she's going to be talking about COVID uh, prehabilitation and digital access. Thank you uh, for inviting me to present at your conference this year. Uh, my name is Sally Singh. I'm a professor in pulmonary and cardiac rehabilitation at the University of Leicester and work clinically at the University Hospitals of Leicester. I've been invited to talk about post-COVID rehabilitation and looking at digital rehabilitation in that field, but also um, the implications for cardiac rehabilitation. So in the next 15 minutes, I'd like to look at the need for rehabilitation in the post-COVID population and really what's the early data showing us in terms of uh, what rehabilitation might look like and finishing off with the implications for cardiac rehabilitation. So I guess many of you may have seen this uh, type of slide before. It identifies these persistent symptoms post-COVID-19. On the left hand side, we have some very early data from Italy. And this uh, diagram simply shows the symptoms reported acutely uh, during the uh, acute stage of COVID. And then on the right hand side in the red bar, we have the symptoms that were reported around 60 days after the first symptom appeared. And you can see that during the acute phase, not surprisingly, fatigue, breathlessness, chest pain, cough, uh, sore throat, loss of appetite, muscle ache were really uh, very prevalent in this population. But at 60 days post-infection, you can see that the profiles changed slightly, but still dominated by fatigue and breathlessness. On the right-hand side, we have a mix of patients that are not only post-hospital, like the uh, first chart shows us, but a mixture of post-hospital and community-managed patients. And this is data taken from uh, a Facebook uh, group in the Netherlands. And similarly, they've looked at the symptom score in grey during the infection and the lighter blue is follow up at 78 days, so not wildly different. And you can see again, there's a very similar pattern. Uh, you know, despite the group being mixed, they're displaying really significant burden of fatigue, breathlessness, um, chest tightness, cough um, and muscle pain, even, you know, uh, several weeks after the initial infection. Now, this data is taken from the FOSS COVID study, which was an NIHR funded study, cohort study to follow up hospitalized patients uh, post discharge. And there were just over a thousand patients, um, a good mix of male and female, on average 58 years old, so younger than we would conventionally see in pulmonary or cardiac rehabilitation. The majority were white, but there was a mix of other um, ethnic minority groups. And at least half of the group had one uh, or two comorbidities and the mean follow up time was um, five months. Interestingly, over 90% had at least one persistent symptom um, with a median number of nine at, at this um, time point. Now this data has been divided into cohorts depending on the um, level of intervention they had whilst they were in hospital. So uh, we're going from left to right. So grade three to four was uh, no continuous supplemental oxygen. Five was continuous oxygen. Six was um, uh, non-invasive ventilation or high flow oxygen. And seven to nine were uh, patients that were largely on ICU mechanically ventilated or other organ support. And this study uh, 
measured a number of, of outcomes and, and looking at symptoms objectively, but this data just shows us the facet, which is fatigue, the MOCA, which is a measure of um, uh, cognitive function, the dyspnea 12, obviously a measure of breathlessness, and the incremental shuttle walking test. And you can see that there's a, a fairly even spread of fatigue throughout the group, as there is breathlessness. Um, and there's some variation in the mocker. So this threshold is uh, 20, uh, 23, identify some cognitive impairment and that uh, represents the percentage. So at least you know, between 10 and 15% of the population have disturbed cognitive function post COVID. The bottom right hand graph shows the incremental shuttle walking test, which may be familiar to a number of you. And again, it's represented as percent predicted. And you can see that um, all groups at, at best are achieving 50% of, of predicted and the group on the right, which is the post ICU group are um, marginally less than that. So you can see that even five months post discharge, these patients are significantly disabled um, by the uh, Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. I think there is some technical difficulty, or are we on stage now? We are on stage. Yeah, stage. Yeah. stage. Sorry for that. I think there was some technical difficulty. Something has happened. Um, is Sally there? Hi, Sally. Thank you Hi. so much. Hi. How are you? Thank you so much for coming. No, that's okay. Yeah, and it. I don't know what happened. I think they are trying to sort it out uh, by the time. If you want to just to tell us about your experience about the COVID and also how the nurses and allied health professionals have uh, had an impact on that place. And I will try to sort out what's happening for your presentation. Thank you. OK, so so we're assuming the presentation stopped at the moment. Is that is that right? Yes, please. There is some technical difficulty. I will find out by the time if you want to try just to tell us how it is, then we will continue with the presentation. Oh, OK, well, we um, I guess there's a couple of interesting things. One is that we um, developed a digital platform that was supported by NHS England's that is really focusing on the components of care that you would anticipate for somebody with post COVID syndrome. And secondly, we have developed a face to face programme for the post COVID population as well. Okay, thank you, Sally. Thank you so much. I think they are trying to find out what happened. Uh, Abu, do you, do you have any questions, or Zoe, as a you know, very specialist for Sally? Any questions? Abu, we can't hear you. You are muted. Yeah, sorry, because the full presentation we couldn't see, so it was in between. Uh, I'm think, trying. I'm trying to yeah, find out what happened. Yeah, Actually, it yeah. was supposed to run. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yes, I've definitely recorded it and sent it to you. Sorry. Just I want to say thank you, whoever watching it, and it is a very a good opportunity. By the time we will find out what happened to Professor Sally Singh's presentation, and there were eight nice fellowship presentations we've seen and they've been everywhere all over the world and it is important for whoever watching this please please apply for the national um you know NA nurses and allied health professional fellowship scheme and that is the only way we can disseminate our good work and also we learn from each other zoe as a physiotherapist would you like to say something to your uh, peers and colleagues or around nationally please I can you hear me? You can't hear me? I don't know what's happening with the technology today. Abu, would you like to say something, yeah. Abu? Yeah, thank you very much for all the presenter and uh, who has done the fellowship, travel fellowship. I would like to say that the 
advanced care practitioners, nurse practitioners, they do a tremendous job in our NHS system. No doubt about it. They are going ahead with the new uh, trends and new clinics and these things they're taking over. And this is a very good thing. And by the way of um, sharing it through this uh, platform, I think more people will be interested to uh, join these fellowship programs and share their um, uh, ideas and the plans. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Abu, and um, thank you so much for press, you know being with us today and sharing as well. And we are still trying to find what happened to Professor Sally's sing presentation. It was really nice. Dutchley says it's ready in the chat to go, so I don't know. Yes, if please. Can you can you start the presentation, please? Group are um, marginally less than that. So you can see that even five months post discharge, these patients are significantly disabled um, by the uh, initial infection. So in terms of how to manage these patients, clearly there is you know, no conclusive evidence, but there was a hint that pulmonary rehabilitation may be an appropriate um, pathway for these patients to follow. And this was taken from an article in the BMJ. Now, pulmonary rehabilitation has a structure that remarkably similar to cardiac rehabilitation, but the, the focus is, is subtly different in that it's very much around symptom management um, with, with exercise training being the really core component to re reduce breathlessness, improve people's cardiorespiratory fitness. Now, the aim of COVID rehabilitation arguably is to support a full recovery, whereas in respiratory patients, you would never anticipate reversing the initial uh, and primary pathology. But you would anticipate in a proportion to support a full recovery, to support symptom management along the way, and, and really return to economic productivity. You may remember that, that, you know, that, that these patients are younger on the whole than patients we conventionally see, um, particularly in pulmonary rehab, but certainly cardiac rehab as well. So getting back to work is really important. Now I've just, displayed the graph that we looked at earlier in a slightly different way, looking at what we might assume to be the treatable traits within the population um, of this post-COVID group, and looking at whether these actually match the common targets in either and or cardiac or pulmonary rehabilitation. And I would suggest that these interventions that we're more familiar with do address a number of these symptoms, for example, fatigue, breathlessness, joint pain, chest pain, cough, sputum, lack of appetite, uh, potentially vertigo, some balance retraining and muscle aches. What I don't think uh, cardiac or pulmonary rehab have been particularly strong in managing is loss of taste or, or loss of smell, which are really uh, some of the classic symptoms, particularly of the acute phase of uh, COVID. There's been some work looking at what uh, a rehabilitation programme might look like, and this is a consensus document that was uh, published by the British Thoracic Society last year. And we surveyed over a thousand healthcare professionals to come up with some broad agreement around what would comprise an assessment at six to eight weeks post discharge for consideration of rehabilitation. And similarly, there was data around the intervention. And you can see at a glance that there was brought, you know, strong agreement or um, agreement around these components that included assessment of quality of life, cough, fatigue, breathlessness, mood, um, potentially PTSD if people had elevated levels of anxiety and depression, et cetera, et cetera. And there was a, a, a real feeling not to reinvent the wheel that we have some very good rehabilitation programs across the country and there was no appetite to uh, develop a, a, a disease specific one for this post-covid population but of course there are some challenges uh, we've heard a lot in the media about fatigue particularly within the context of chronic fatigue syndrome which um, it is thought to be associated with post-covid and clearly, you know, some patients will have PTSD um, because we've observed that, particularly in those that uh, survive critical illness. But clearly there's been some other stresses around COVID-19 that have affected all, all of us um, in terms of social isolation, physical distancing, et cetera, et cetera. So we really do need to integrate with other services that are very skilled in managing these consequences. 
There's some early data looking at feasibility and acceptability of uh, structured rehabilitation programmes for those with uh, post-COVID syndrome. This was a project that uh, was published from Switzerland and they looked at post-hospital discharge. So again, this, this is uh, those that had um, severe initial infections that were managed in the hospital. They looked at uh, training twice a week, which is pretty typical of a, a UK-based cardiac rehab programme. But interestingly, although 65 were offered, only 12 of those enrolled and, and three dropped out. But of those that were remaining, uh, they had significant improvements in their six minute walking test and actually reported that the training was tolerable in terms of intensity and duration, giving us some hints that this may be an acceptable model to support uh, an expedite recovery. In the UK, we've adapted our rehabilitation programme to suit the COVID population. And it's really a combination of expertise that we have in cardiac rehabilitation combined with expertise in pulmonary rehabilitation. And it follows a very similar structure of um, individually prescribed and progressed exercise with a package of education to support self-management and symptom control um, for, for the post-COVID population. And you can see these are some of the outcomes. So we have measures of exercise tolerance across the top, quality of life, fatigue with the facets, the EQ5D thermometer, the mocha for cognition and um, anxiety and depression. And we really get very encouraging results in terms of changes in exercise capacity, uh, quality of life, fatigue, and the EQ5D, and interestingly, cognition. We don't get much change in anxiety and depression. And for those of you familiar with this measure, uh, you'll recognize that the, the levels when patients were assessed at baseline were actually pretty low. So this data isn't a randomized control trial. We've got 30 patients and they were about five months post discharge. So you'd like to assume that a significant amount of natural recovery would have occurred. So we're very encouraged by these results. Now, of course, there's been a lot in the media about the complexities of uh, exercise and fatigue. And we look very specifically at, at this data. And this is plotting changes in fatigue against changes in uh, walking performance. And you would want most people to be in the top right-hand corner, which is where they have reduced fatigue and an increased uh, exercise capacity. And you can see from our data, the vast majority of patients are actually in this cohort. We actually uh, have nobody uh, out of this group where we made their fatigue worse and their exercise capacity fell. So we're very encouraged by this data uh, and hope to uh, develop this package of care further. We've also developed a, a digital package for those uh, post COVID and this was supported by NHS England. It's delivered in two phases. The first phase is open access um, that gives patients whether they're post-hospital or post, uh, sorry, managed in the hospital or the community, it gives patients a lot of advice about the symptoms that they might expect and their recovery and how patients can support their own recovery as well. And there's advice on there um, in terms of return to work, families and friends, et cetera. And this was developed by experts up and down the country that have particular expertise in, in the novel areas that affect COVID, that are affected by COVID. And this is just some of the, some of the data. We've now got nearly uh, one and a half million users. Um, and it's just interesting to see the sort of health seeking behaviors of the post COVID population. You can see that again, fatigue was uh, a very popular site, but also MSK, cough, um, taste and smell, shortness of breath, friends and family return to work, memory and managing oxygen. And currently, perhaps this is no big surprise, but the numbers in the UK are dropping slightly, uh, but the numbers in the US and India are increasing. There is also a second stage to this website. It's a password protected site that um, is controlled by a team of healthcare professionals, and that may be in cardiac rehab or pulmonary rehab or an IAP service. And it's really a guided rehabilitation program for post-COVID uh, individuals that it has an exercise program within it it has symptom thermometers and a symptom tracker you can ask the expert there's a forum where you can talk to other people with uh struggling with post-covid on the site 
and it has a number of uh, areas that cover the common symptoms that we've seen uh, post-COVID. So uh, taste and smell, fatigue, breathlessness, cough, managing your day, anxiety, uh, sleep. Um, and uh, you know, this was all written by uh, national experts. Now, coming back to the uh, FOSS-COVID study, they produced this very nice diagram looking at clusters of patients um, using the data that they got based on their um, symptom scores here and uh, cognitive impairments and found that, that there were four discrete groups. Those with very severe mental health and physical health problems and those with severe uh, physical and mental health problems. And then we have the largest group here at the bottom left that had mild physical impairments. And then an interesting group over on the right hand side that had moderate uh, mental and physical impairment, but actually poor cognition as well. And you might imagine that you would stratify care to match the characteristics of the uh, individuals. Of course, this hasn't been tested. Um, there are very few models of care for uh, patients post COVID that have been tested. But you might speculate those with mild impairments would, would manage reasonably well with a light touch approach, for example, uh, the digital COVID recovery program. But those with more significant problems would probably need um, a more supportive environment that would address their multiple needs. And that would include psychological therapies, exercise therapy, weight management, um, and vocational support. So what did the pandemic mean for cardiac rehabilitation? Well, this will come as no big surprise, but the provision of cardiac rehabilitation largely dropped off the edge of a cliff because of lockdown. So it did give us an opportunity to explore alternative models of service delivery that might be digital, they might be uh, telehealth, um, you know, video conferencing or manual based. So I think there are plenty of opportunities to explore and give people permission to explore these other um, modes of delivery in a way that people have perhaps been a little uh, re reluctant to try. I also think cardiac rehab has the potential or the opportunity to integrate with the post-COVID population and, and as time goes on we'll see how uh, rehabilitation services develop. So in conclusion I think pulmonary and cardiac rehabilitation provide a comprehensive platform to deliver a recovery program for the post-COVID population but I do think we need to adapt and enhance the service with further integration of, of the wider multidisciplinary team. And we have the potential to deliver alternative formats of rehabilitation to meet the need, both it, for the cardiac population and, of course, the post-COVID population. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Salising. It was absolutely amazing presentation and it's really nice to hear from you as well. And as we are you know, running out of time, I would like to say thank you so much for all of our presenters and especially Professor Salising to finish the excellent talk about COVID and how to enhance the uh, current situation of COVID pandemic with a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, Abu, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And Zoe has to leave uh, because due to clinical commitments. And I would like to say thank you for everyone uh, who has presented today, including our SCTS team who has done an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sanisen. Thank you. Bye, everyone.